In this video, we're going to look at an alternative way of expressing complex numbers, and we're going to look at how we express them in something called the polar form. We're also going to look at some basic operations using complex numbers in the polar form. Now on the left hand side, we have Z1, Z2 and Z3, and each of these are complex numbers expressed in the form that we've seen previously. Now this form is either called the Cartesian or the rectangular form, and here we see the real and the imaginary component separated. So if we take Z1 for example, that has a real component of 4 and an imaginary component of 3J. The combining of the real and the imaginary gives us the complex number 4 plus 3J. Now the starting point for converting each of these to polar form is to consider something called an Argand diagram. And on the right hand side I've constructed the template for an Argand diagram. Now on an Argand diagram, the x-axis represents the real components of our complex numbers, and the y-axis represents the imaginary component. So if we were to plot Z1 on the Argand diagram, we have a real component of 4, we have an imaginary component of 3j, and that would be represented by a point on our Argand diagram. So our complex number, Z1 can be represented like so. We'll do the same for Z2 and Z3 and then we'll look at how we convert these into the polar form. So Z2 is 2 minus 3j, so we go 2 on our real axis, minus 3j on our imaginary axis, and that will give us Z2 on our Argand diagram. Now finally we have Z3 which is minus 5 plus 2j, so we're going to go up 2 on our imaginary axis and that will give us Z3 on our Argand diagram. Now when we convert these to the polar form, a polar form has two things. It has something called the modulus, which is the magnitude of the lines we've drawn, and it also has something called the argument which is essentially the angle or the direction. And when we define the argument, or when we define the angle, we need to use the following convention. We have zero degrees is in the three o'clock position, and the positive direction is anti-clockwise, like so. We've seen this convention before when we've worked with vectors and so on. So let's take Z1. We need to find the modulus or the magnitude of Z1. Well, we can use Pythagoras' theorem here because Z1 forms a triangle and on one of the shorter sides of the triangle we have 4 and on the other side we have 3j. Now because the axis is the imaginary axis, we can just treat that as a length of 3. So let's write as follows. We have the magnitude or the modulus of Z1 equals, using Pythagoras' theorem, the square root of 4 squared plus 3 squared. Pythagoras' theorem states that the square of the longest side equals the sum of the square of the two shorter sides, and we've just used that rule there to find the modulus of Z1. When we run that through the calculator, we get an answer of 5. So next we can find the argument, and the argument is going to be the angle here on our Argand diagram. If we refer to our convention, we can see that that's going to be positive. And we can use trigonometry here, because one of our trig identities states that tan theta equals opposite over adjacent. If we look at that triangle, opposite the angle is here, and so the adjacent is the length along the bottom. So we write arg, the argument, z1 equals tan to the minus 1, opposite, well the opposite is 3j, or on our Argand diagram, that's just 3, divided by 4, giving us an angle in degrees equal to 36.9 to one decimal place. Let's repeat that for z2, so the modulus of z2 equals the square root, here we have 2 squared plus minus 3 squared, all square rooted, 
Remember the square of a negative number just gives us a positive number. So in effect, we have two squared plus three squared, all square rooted, and that comes out to be 3.61 to two decimal places. And here's where we have to be a little bit careful because the argument of Z2 is going to be this angle here on the diagram, but we can see that this time, according to our convention, that this angle is going to be negative. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate the angle and then apply the negative sign. The angle, using the trig identity, is tan to the minus one of opposite over adjacent. Well, we're forming a triangle again here. We have this triangle here, and we're looking at this angle here. So we have tan to the minus one of the opposite, well, the opposite is three, we're just looking at the magnitudes of the sides of the triangle here. We'll apply the sign afterwards, and you'll see why on the next example. So we have 3 over 2, which equals 56.3 degrees, but it's going to be negative 56.3 because of our convention. Okay, let's take a look at our final example. And the important thing to remember is the convention, because we can see here that our Z3 is pointing up and to the left. So our angle this time, and again I'll use a different colour to make this clear, our angle this time is going to be this angle here. That's going to be our argument of Z3. What we're going to do is we're going to find the angle in here. I'll just call it theta for now. And once we've found theta, we can determine the argument. Let's begin with our modulus. The modulus of Z3 is the square root of minus 5 squared, which is just 5 squared, plus 2 squared. Therefore, the modulus of Z3 equals 5.39. Now, the argument of Z3 if we refer to our diagram, it's just 180 minus theta. So from the diagram, 180 would take us all the way back round to the x-axis, but we're going 180 minus theta. It's the orange arrow on our diagram. So we have 180 minus theta, and theta is going to be tan to the minus one of opposite over adjacent, this time on this triangle here. So we have 180 minus tan to the minus 1 opposite is 2, adjacent is 5. Again, we're just using the magnitudes because we're making our adjustment afterwards. And that gives us an answer of 158.2 to one decimal place. So there we've seen how we can convert from our Cartesian or our rectangular form into polar form.